The San Francisco Foundation has been a valuable resource, not only as a charitable advisor to my clients, but to me as well. I became a client of the foundation the last couple of years. And um, they offer personalized strategies and resources to support your client's unique philanthropic journey. And I think what makes this foundation so special is that they go beyond the, the standard donor advised fund model. Um, what really impresses me about San Francisco Foundation is their real hands-on grassroots commitment to our local communities and the region. Um, having grown up in San Francisco, I, I love their commitment to our city. Uh, Hope SF is a great example of that commitment to our neighborhoods and, and the issues surrounding that. The foundation has a unique position to work as a convener, which the word Fred uses, which I think is terrific, of important conversations of issues facing our cities with corporations, uh, other private foundations, families, of course, um, and public officials. So. Um, if you have clients who want to give back to the Bay Area community, the San Francisco Foundation can help make them uh, get the most impact with their philanthropy in the causes they most care about, like public education, job training, housing, the environment, health care, and community building. If you've not yet worked with the SF Foundation, I encourage you to take an early opportunity to learn about more about them and how they can help your clients invest in solutions for problems that are very pressing in our Bay Area. Tony? So it's a pleasure to be up here and see so many uh, familiar faces of some of my favorite advisors in the Bay Area. Thank you all for, for coming. It's really great. Uh, I also have the added pleasure of introducing our speaker, Coventry Edwards Pitt, uh, in front of me here. Uh, Covey comes to us from uh, Boston, where she is the Chief advisory, Wealth Advisory Officer of uh, Ballantine Partners. Uh, Ballantyne has about 140 client family relations so with about uh, an average net worth of $50 million. Uh, Covey also serves on the Professional Advisory Committee for the Boston Foundation, so we're pack to pack here. Um, and uh, any professional advisor who works with high net worth clients is familiar with how difficult it is to, to help uh, for parents to, to, to navigate the terrain of wealth transfer, uh, family values, and, and child rearing. And um, with families like that, ensuring that family wealth doesn't contribute to a child's lack of motivation, sense of purpose, uh, or self is, is critical. Uh, and Covey, Covey's written her book, uh, Raised Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise, a copy of which you'll receive at the conclusion of the event today, um, to provide parents with, with direct insight from children who have been successful in being raised with wealth uh, and have emerged to lead happy, healthy, productive lives of their own. Uh, and Covey is going to share with us some of the lessons and her thoughts on the role of the professional advisor in assisting clients to implement these family best practices. So please join me in giving Covey uh, a warm San Francisco welcome on a, on a day when it's needed. Um, Covey, please, uh, please come up. I'm so thrilled to be in a room of advisors because I know you all get these issues. Um, so let me... I'm going to tell you about why I wrote this book, and I'm going to talk about some of the key takeaways. And But everyone is actually leaving with a copy of the book, and I really do recommend you read it, uh, because it's filled with very tangible stories. Um, and a question that came up at my table is, is this just for people like us, or is this for clients? And actually, I wrote it to give it to my clients. So it's, it's for your clients, especially those who may not want to really engage with these issues. It may be easier for them to read a book uh, and then have a, a conversation about this. So. So let me tell you a little bit of background about why I wrote this. So I'm Chief Wealth Advisory Officer of my firm, and, and we're a holistic uh, wealth advisor up in the Boston area. And you know, you may wonder why did a firm allow their Chief Wealth Advisory Officer to take time to work on a book like this? Um, the reason is because these issues about how to help our clients make sure that their wealth is not demotivating their children are at the core of the issues that our clients are most worried about, as I'm sure you all understand. Um, and so I, uh, when I think about my sort of the situation with um, the clients that I have and I think about what they're really struggling with, um, it comes down to the issue with their children. And when people first come to us, they're not necessarily thinking about this. You know, they come to advisors like us for tax advice, estate advice, investment advice. Usually the issue about whether their kids are going to be demoted by wealth is not on the top ten list of priorities. Um, but what you find after you work with them for a number of years, as I'm sure you all understand, is that our great technical advice helps take care of all the other issues. And then what emerges as the most intractable of the problems are the issues with the kids. 
Uh, so I'll give you an example of a couple of situations I've been involved in. I'm sure you all have your own examples. Um, I have been asked to help a child who was sort of blowing through what should have been a three-month trust distribution in about two weeks um, to help budget them and help them sort of figure out how to deal with that. Um, I've, asked, I've been asked to help a 30-year-old who cannot sort of engage in a career in any sort of long-term way to uh, help them do career testing and help them sort of get reoriented. And, and this work is very fulfilling, and I'm glad I can do it, but I think you all understand when I say that it's so much, it would have been so much easier to have been involved in those situations at an earlier stage. And the work that we can do in those situations, while helpful, is kind of limited. Um, and this is by no means unique to our firm. You know, this is a situation we may all be familiar with that pretty damning statistic that sort of floats around the wealth industry that 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of wealthy families fail to successfully pass their money onto their children. And not for lack of all the wonderful advice we give, but um, for lack of the fact that the children are not prepared to know how to handle the money. Um, and so I faced with, I'm sort of a helper-oriented person. I want to really help my clients and face with this sort of damning statistic every day, going to work thinking, what am I doing every day if 70% of the time this is all going to fail anyway? Um, I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I started to think, I really have to sort of dig into what is the cause here. And what I came across is um, a very counterintuitive statement that I'm sure you all know deep in your heart through your work. Above a certain level of wealth, money makes parenting, parenting harder, not easier. And when you try to explain that to clients, they find that very counterintuitive. Um, but actually, Malcolm Gladwell, in his latest book, David and Goliath, devotes about five pages to this very phenomenon. He's interviewed, when I was reading, I was so excited to come across this example because it's exactly what we see in our work every day. He was interviewing a Hollywood mogul who's now very successful, and the guy is sort of regaling uh, Malcolm Gladwell with these stories of his rough and tumble youth on the streets of Minneapolis and all of the um, wonderful life lessons he learned sort of through his street smarts and how he's applied that in his career and how that's really what's made him successful. And as the guy is describing all this, this sort of light bulb goes off in his head where he says, how are my kids going to learn any of those things when they're starting life on sort of in front row seats at Lakers games? And I thought, yep, that, that is it. Um, and you can sort of roll this out and play this out in the story of two hypothetical kids. Uh, and I, I like to go through this just for a couple of minutes to have us understand all the different lessons that a children who's raised in an affluent setting may not get uh, through no one's fault. Usually the parents are doing their utmost to be caring and giving parents. So when a kid, say there's a hypothetical kid who wasn't raised very much and there's another children who was uh, another child raised in a very affluent setting. The first child when they're about six or seven, um, is probably being told by the parents that they have to do something to contribute around the household. They have to either, you know, keep their room clean, they have to wash the dishes, they have to do some sort of something. Um, the second child may be being raised in a house where there's household staff who may have it written into their contracts that they do those things. Okay, now you roll the clock forward to say 15 or 16. The first kid is probably starting to do the math and think, if I want to drive, I'm going to need to get a job, I'm going to need to make some money, I'm going to need to save that money, I'm going to need to buy a car and probably a used car, and then I'll need to continue making money for gas and all this kind of stuff. The second kid is probably given a car as a present for passing their driver's test and maybe a credit card to pay for gas. Okay, now you roll the clock forward till these kids are out of college. The first kid is probably, if they were even lucky enough to have the parents pay for school, um, given a very clear expectation that we are done. You know, go forth, good luck, uh, and we're sure you can support yourself, and that's wonderful. Whereas the, the second kid is probably given a much more nuanced message that sounds something like, we have family wealth, and it's here to help you, and you need to find your passion, and we will use that wealth to help you sort of embrace that passion. And that is complicated for a kid to understand. We'll talk more about that. Uh, so when you compare those two examples and these two children and you think about all the lessons that the first kid gets that the second one doesn't, um, and all because the parents are just trying to be helpful, you start to really put your arms around this problem. So I was sitting here to myself thinking, is this inevitable? You know, it was just, are we just going to sort of wash our hands and think there's nothing that can be done? Uh, I had read every book on this topic. I, I have a, I should say I'm also raising my own child, although I don't have great wealth that I'm um, accompanying that process with, but um, my daughter is six, so my, uh, my bookshelf at home is all parenting books, and my bookshelf at work is all parenting with wealth books, and I had read all of these books, and what I couldn't find, the book I really wanted, I couldn't find, which was 
uh, one that found real life kids who grew up with money and, sometimes I say but, but when I'm being optimistic I say and, grew up to be uh, productive and motivated and content and engaged in their life and their work life. And I thought to myself, I really want to find these people. Uh, just for me personally, in my own work with my clients, I would love to have had the opportunity to sit down with people like this, interview them and say, how did this happen to you? you know, how did you get to be this way? What did your parents do? And when I couldn't find a book like this, and I started thinking, well, I would really like to have these conversations, I thought, well, let me just set up these interviews and let me see what I learn. And if it's useful, maybe I can spread these messages out to other people. So, so that was the impetus. So then let me talk about who I sought out. Um, so at my table, we were talking about how this whole field is filled with a lot of the negative stories. We sort of all have probably seen them in our own work, and we've seen them in a lot of books. Uh, and in fact, I'm sort of grateful those stories are out there because about 20 years ago, you couldn't even say that wealth was a negative thing. You know, and then a lot of research came out um, about the sort of golden ghetto problems and Thayer Willis and other people. And that was at least helpful so we could say to clients, you know, it's, it's not always easy. This is actually kind of complicated. Um, but I felt like that was out there. We kind of all know what the negative is. And I really wanted to focus on the positive. You know, there are some success stories. Let's hear from them. Um, the other thing I wanted to focus on was people's real life experiences. All the books I read, and you know, some great ones like *Raising Financially Fit Kids* by Jolene Godfrey, *Silver Spoon Kids*. Um, I love those books, um, but there are a lot of theories in there, and I wanted to be able to really put all these wonderful theories to the test of real life experience, what people had actually uh, seen when they were being raised by their parents. Um, and the third thing was I really wanted to focus on real people with real voices. So. You'll see when you read the book, everyone's name has been changed because I would never have been able to get any of these people to talk to me, obviously, um, had I not changed their name, but all the quotes are verbatim. And so when you read them, and, I, and I've been told this by people that when they read the book, the stories and the quotes really stay with them because you can picture people saying this because it's real people saying this. And um, this is one of the reasons I give it to not only my clients, but sometimes to next gens who, they, who are themselves struggling because I think they will see in this in these stories, people that look a lot like them, but who are just in a little bit of a different situation in life because of some of the decisions they've made. Um, so those are, that's why I was seeking out success. So now let me talk about how I define success. Um, here's how I didn't define success. I did not find people who had replicated the financial wealth of their parents. That was not what I was looking for. First of all, we all know how difficult that is. Um, secondly, I don't think it really relates to my concept of success, which is sort of like you know it when you see it, and I'm sure we all hopefully have some clients, children who look like this. Um, they're content, they're productive, they're engaged in their own careers. Um, they tend to be pretty self-sufficient. Um, they tend to also be, although this wasn't one of the things I set as an absolute must in people I was speaking to, but it turned out to be the case with almost everyone I spoke to, they tend to be grateful for anything their parents give them which is so stunning <laughs> compared to a lot of the people that we end up seeing sometimes. So that's what I set out to find. Uh, what's interesting is when I then spoke to all these people, uh, they turned out that they all shared four characteristics. So I'm going to tell you about these four characteristics, and then that ac actually you'll see relates to this question, because it does actually relate to this question, how much is too much. OK, so the first characteristic, which I, I say first, because this was the characteristic that all the interviewees pointed to as the most important, um, all these people had demonstrated the ability in their own lives to earn their own money and live largely off of this money, or largely contentedly off of this money. Uh, it didn't mean that they never had accepted any wealth transfers from their parents. And in fact, the whole last chapter of the book is all about all sorts of wealth transfers and sort of the gray areas and how that went well. But what it meant, and this is getting pretty psychological, but I think that's important, it meant that all of the people I spoke to said to me some version of, in my heart of hearts, I know that if my family's money goes poof tomorrow, I will be OK. And they also said, it wasn't until I reached that point in my life where I felt like that, that I felt like my own person. And I thought that was just stunning, uh, because especially speaking to all of us who are advisors, that's not what we tend to hear a lot about. It's not what we tend to talk to our clients a lot about, because our clients typically are in their 50s and 60s. They are thinking about legacy. They're thinking about wealth transfer. They're thinking about 
what is all this money for if not to help my child? I want to see this money doing something helpful in my child's life. Um, is there a business I can invest in for them? Oh, I don't like the apartment they're in. They, have, they should be in a nicer place. Can I, can I make that better for them? Uh, lots of sort of how can I do something for them? But what I heard from these kids was they weren't asking for it, and they so appreciated the chance to do these things on their own, that that was like a real gift that their parents had given them. Okay, so that's uh, number one. Number two is these kids all have the ability to set their own vocational goals and stick to them. And we'll come back to that, but um, I'm sure you have situations where that's not always the case and sort of the serial job changer. Uh, these kids had a real patience where they were able to stick to jobs. They were sort of able to go through the ebbs and flows of when they weren't great, when they were better. Uh, and over time, they amassed a career progression that they derived a lot of contentment from. Uh, the third characteristic is that these people had a sense of self-worth, and you can see this sort of flows from number one and two. Um, they had a sense of self-worth that was driven more by their own accomplishments and choices in life than by what had been given to them by their parents. Uh, and the fourth one is these kids all had been given probably the greatest gift parents can give their kids, which is the opportunity to pick themselves up after some problem. Uh, they had a real sort of hard-earned Resilience. So they'd all been given some chance in their upbringing to get out of some problem on their own without having the money come in and sort of swoop in and do it for them. So uh, these success factors, I started to actually use a lot in my work. So um, to, to Fred's point about um, us being an advisor community and how we can also help each other, uh, help our clients, you know, I'm sure many of us are asked the question, when is the right age to give the kids money? When is the right age to uh, tell them about the money? And how much is too much to give them? Um, especially on the age question, I, I have long said, obviously, there's, there's no wonderful age where everyone is ready to receive money. I'm sure we all have situations with there's 50-year-olds who are having real problems, and then there's 22-year-olds who are doing great. Um, that age is not a great barometer of readiness. But now I'm able to point to the success factors and say, that is a much better barometer of readiness. If you can say that your kid has achieved these success factors, they're probably going to be able to handle the money that you give them. If they haven't, and even if they're 50 years old, even a small amount of money, I mean, I'm talking, you know, fourteen to you know, $28,000 annual gifting can derail them. And, and that's why this question, I think, is so interesting because um, people always ask this question. And so we wanted to put this question as a, um, a sort of a leader question. But what I find really interesting about this question is that it almost anything can be too much if a child has not developed these core fundamental skills. I mean, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen too, kids live off of annual gifts um, and sort of reduce their life to living within that amount that they've been given and feeling sort of productive because they're not spending beyond that, but they're not really productive in a in sort of an engaged life way. So you'll see we'll come back to this issue of it's not just uh, how much is too much money. It's too much everything. It's too much doing for your kids, um, too much letting them um, get out of problems. And what you'll see in the book, and I'm going to go through some examples today, of how parents avoided this, how they set limits so the kids could take ownership of their own success. Um, so I feel, I put this up here to say, this isn't really the right question. The right question is how can we give these kids the fundamental skills they need regardless of the amount of money they are given. Okay, so the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk in some specifics about uh, the, the lessons from the book. So the book is split into five key chapters, uh, three, and they're all lessons, key lessons that I learned from these interviews. So, Three of the chapters are in the home when kids are young and maybe parents have a little bit more control over them and their development. And the last two chapters are when kids are, say, in their 20s to 30s and they are out of school, they are starting to embark on their own careers, and how parents relate to children in that situation and especially how does money transfer work in those years because that's when it really gets very tricky. Um, so I'm going to talk pr primarily about the, uh, two, two main uh, points that happen when kids are young and in their home, in the home. Um, but but later we, during the Q and A, we can talk about whether there's a there's a time that's too late. Because I actually I'm pretty optimistic about that. I don't think that there's ever a time that's completely too late. Um, okay, so the first one's about setting limits. So for each of these these uh, core 
uh, chapters, I'm going to talk about the headlines and then a story that I heard from the interviews that back up the headline. So the first chapter, and I'm going to read you just sort of opening to this chapter to set the stage. Um, this chapter is called, Allow Your Child to Strive, Don't Buy Their Success. Uh, and the intro paragraph says, is there a parent on earth, wealthy or not, who doesn't want their child to be independent and happy? As Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck says, most parents think, I would do anything, give anything, to make my children successful. And yet, she goes on to say, many of the things they do boomerang. We see this problem played out most starkly in affluent families. While the family funds are often tapped with the express purpose of supporting the next generation's success, these efforts can backfire when the money and the opportunities it buys instead rob the young adults of the desire and the ability to find their own success. So you're probably pretty familiar with this problem. So what, what do parents do? Okay, so when I say each of these headlines, they're going to sound really obvious and like, oh, of course people should do this. But you'll see when I give the example of where the rubber meets the road. It's not always easy. Um, so the first one is love your child enough to set limits. Okay, sure. Uh, but let me talk about the example. So this, this may sound familiar to some of you, a problem your clients have faced. So there was a gentleman I interviewed named Craig. Uh, about half the group I interviewed were in their 20s and 30s and half were in their 50s and 60s. And the latter group was very interesting because they had themselves been raised with money and now they were raising their own children with money so they could sort of look forward and backward. Craig was one of these people. So he was talking to me about how um, one of the first things he said was, I knew that when um, I was raising my children, I made a big mistake. And I knew it at the time, but I did it anyway. I said, what was that? And he said, oh, I bought a plane. Uh, so what he said to me was that his youngest, his daughter, was very young uh, when he bought a plane. And he thinks that it really affected her view on life and uh, sort of materialism. So he was telling me about roll the clock forward. This daughter is now having come out of college. And she uh, decides that she's going to move for the summer to the family's unoccupied Park City, Utah home, where she's going to live for the summer and write her novel. OK. So this summer becomes 18 months where there's no novel, there's no job, there's no rent. Uh, OK. So now what, what can be done? And you probably all face something like this, because there's always an unoccupied home, isn't there? And, and there's typically a child who wants to live in there. Uh, so what they did, and I uh, think what they did was really amazing, they, he, Craig and his wife sort of looked at each other and said, this is, a, this is a real issue now. And they flew out to Park City. I don't know whether it was on their plane or not, but they flew out to Park City, Utah. And they said they sat, her daughter, they sat their daughter down at breakfast, and they said, this is going to end. What we're going to do is we are going to move you to New York City. We're going to pay your rent for a year. And at the end of that year, you are going to get a job, and you're going to be able to support yourself. And we are not going to give you any more money. And he said that it was the first moment in her life when there was actual fear in her eyes. But this was about 10 years ago. And she is nine years now into a very successful and interestingly lucrative, although that wasn't a goal, uh, career that she found during that one year period in New York when she was sort of peddled the metal and had to find a job. Now, when you look at this in hindsight, it all seems very tied up in a bow. And of course, that sounds like a great thing to do. Um, but what I find is amazing is think of being the parents in the situation. So you know that your child knows you've got all this money and that you absolutely don't need any rent to be paid. And you don't need to kick her out of the house. So when they flew there and they sat her down for this breakfast, they're sitting there knowing she knows we're just doing this quote for her own good. And that is not something that any 22-year-old wants to hear, uh, something that their parents think is for their own good. And um, this is something I see being very challenging when I'm speaking to my clients about this issue, that, that having to sort of live in that very uncomfortable spot with a child and embrace this tension, because it is a lot of conflict, um, is so uncomfortable for people that most people don't do what Craig and his wife did. They don't sort of go there and have that conversation and then live through the next 11 months watching their child, I'm sure, not love the process of having to look for a job. But they stuck with it. And it really was very helpful. Um, OK, so the next example I'll give you is um, don't, it's under the headline, don't rescue your child. OK, so there was a woman I spoke with, Jane, who's now in her early 30s. But she was telling me a story about how when she was 16, she had her parents' credit card. And she, through two fun-filled weekends, spent about $1,000 on this credit card that uh, was not approved. OK, so she said that what happened was her dad gets the bill. 
and in a very sort of calm, non-judgmental way, says to her, um, these weren't approved, you have to pay me back. Now, this is interesting because a lot of our clients probably face situations like this. Did she have money to pay him back? No. You know, did she have a job? No. So um, how is she going to pay them back? Well, what Jane's parents did that was very creative was they had a horse operation, and they said, well, we would typically pay someone $7 an hour to clean the stalls. We're going to pay you $7 an hour to clean the stalls. And you're going to work 40 hours a week because that's what you need to do to, quote, get used to a real job. And um, it took her four weeks of her summer to pay them back. And what's fascinating to me about this story, a couple things. Again, thinking about being the parent this story. One is, for the parents, $1,000 was beyond a rounding error. I mean, just not even in their, you know. But when they thought about their 16-year-old daughter, they thought it should not be a rounding error for her. $1,000 is a lot of money, and she should understand that. Number two, this was you know not that long ago. It was definitely in the uh, era in which enrichment situations and enrichment experiences and leadership experiences over uh, summers are great for high school students or, and are what most are doing. They were willing as parents to give up on that to have their daughter clean out the horse stalls <laughs> for four weeks to teach her this lesson. And it was a very useful lesson. She, she said this to me as one of the most useful things she learned in her life. Because number one, she learned how the money she had blown through in about two hours, how long that actually takes to make. Um, she also learned a lot about the value of hard work in general. And she learned she didn't want to clean out horse stalls for the rest of her life. Um, but so I, I put that all under the headline of, again, this is not easy for parents. Um, and you can just know that she did not love that period. Uh, and she said things like that, like I was so I was so tough to my parents during that period. But I'm, now I'm so grateful. I heard that re recurring theme that you know gratitude comes about 15 years after. So, <laughs> so, so we have to just all encourage our clients not to look for it at the time. Um, okay, and then the final story in this section is about um, supporting your children. Yes, but doing so in a way that allows them to have something to strive for rather than just sort of buying the outcome. So there's a story in the book, a woman, Sam, Samantha goes by Sam, and she came out of college and she was, um, she was either English or creative writing and she wanted a job in publishing, which we all know is not easy anyway. Um, so she, when she was talking to me, was just glowing with pride. She's about four years after this now saying, it was so hard, but you know, I was so tough. I just, I just sort of kept at it and it took me six months and finally I got a job and I'm the only one of my friends who has a job and I'm not 100% completely financially independent of my parents, but I'm really close. And she was just so proud of herself and I was just taking this all down. I recorded all these too, so I, I wouldn't lose this sort of the tone in her voice. Well, then I talked to her parents and her dad said, well, yes, that is true. That, that's what happened. But what you're not hearing is what also happened, which is that she came to me very early in the process and said, do you know anyone who can get me a job? And he said, I don't. I would love to help you, but I'm in finance. He was a venture capitalist. I don't know anyone. Um, and she kept coming and asking, and he kept not helping her. And he said he had to endure six months of this torture of watching his daughter try to get a job and really think it might not work. And he has a great quote in the book, which is, as the parent, you have to endure the pain, and the pain is watching your child struggle. But what's amazing is parents and children have different experiences. When she talked to me, I don't think she left all that stuff out because she you know, didn't want to talk about it. I think she left it out because that is not what figures into her most predominant memories of this experience. What figures the most is her pride in herself at having done it and having gotten the job. And so I, I try to relay these stories to my clients now to say, look, you know, as the parent, you're just going to have a different experience with the child. You're going to be in torture, you know, watching your child struggle. But just know that that's not what they're going to take from it. They're just going to be happy that they, they did it. Um, OK, so there's actually a, a little, um, there's a, a metaphor that sort of um, people talk about relative to eagles, which is sort of a good summary of the section, which is, I'm not actually sure this is biologically true, but you might hear people talk about this metaphor, and it's very apt. When eagles are raising their young, they uh, go out and they find these twigs that have thorns on them, and then they build the nest out of the twigs and the thorns. And then they line the nest with nice soft little feathers and everything, and the babies are born on the soft feathers. And as they get bigger, they um, start to hit the thorns. And it's the pain of hitting the thorns that actually 
motivates them to fly. Otherwise, they just hang out in the soft feathers. I mean, why would they go anywhere? Um, and, and so I think about this a lot now with my clients, thinking, what are they doing and what can they do to create the thorns? Because most of what our clients do are all the feathers, basically, uh, and, and fret linens and the equivalent thereof. Um, OK, so now I'm going to talk about the work chapter, and I'll uh, move on there. So, so we all, of course, want to raise our own children to have a wonderful sense of work ethic. And I think our clients, uh, that's usually a, an important part of what they're trying to do with their kids. But how does that actually happen? So a big piece of what I talked to these kids about was what did your parents do to actually create a sense of work ethic in your mind and to sort of inspire you to work? So there's about five main things that they did. Um, the first thing, and this cannot be underestimated, this was everyone's first answer, was role model work. And I have some wonderful, fascinating stories in the book about how parents did this. Um, I'm going to read you one from a, a guy I interviewed, Mark. And his dad was um, very busy, essentially early private equity, um, wasn't home every night. But uh, I'll, when he was home, he did an interesting thing, which was talk to his kids over the dinner table about his job and what that was like. So let me just read you a little bit of this. Um, first, Mark said, um, he and his brother recognized their parents' work ethic early on. He said, we saw that they had a sense of responsibility and moderation. We saw the work that it took them to achieve their success, the late nights, the hard work. We saw the value in what that work achieved. Then he goes on to talk about the situation where his dad would talk about his work over dinner. Um, he said he loved talking about the daily trials and successes of turning businesses around, working through the problems he was facing in the office, fighting fires, coming up with solutions, talking basically all about problems and how he dealt with them. And so Mark says, we developed a hell of a lot of appreciation for the fact that he threw himself in it, subjected himself to chaos, challenge, high levels of aggravation. He was pushing himself, and he wasn't doing it for the money. He was guided by a really, really strong work ethic, a sense of obligation to the companies and workers he was dealing with to make them better, a sense of high standards. As kids, we were internalizing those standards and holding them up for ourselves. So I thought this was fascinating. There were a lot of other stories like this. Um, and so I encourage my clients now not only to model work, but to talk about their work. You know, I think that in general, as I, I mean, I, just from my own experience as a parent, I know that I tend to compartmentalize, and there's my day job, and then I come home, and it's all Legos and everything, you know, what, whatever my daughter wants to do. And ever since I heard this from these interviewees, I've been trying to share more about what my work life is like, because that's how I've realized these kids painted a picture for themselves of what that would be like when they were out in the work world. And yeah, it wasn't all going to be rosy. And so hearing things from Mark's dad about yeah, you know, he'd go through weeks, months of things being aggravating, but he prevailed, and yes, it was worth it, and yes, he derived a sense of contentment from that process. That, I think, was so helpful. Mark went on to be um, in finance himself, and he said, that was so helpful when I went through days at work that weren't all great to know that this is just what my dad had done, and this, this is work. You know, it's, it's not all wonderful, but it's fulfilling. Um, okay, so the next important thing, and this is all under the headline of setting a really clear uh, message from day one that there's an expectation that your child works. And this is everything from chores in the home to high school jobs to working out of college. And um, let's talk about chores for a second. So when I was researching this, because I kept hearing about chores from the kids I interviewed, turns out they've done studies that kids given chores as early as age three to five end up with higher self-discipline scores later in life, which is very interesting. Um, what I find interesting about the chore issue is, so how do you get kids to do chores when there's household staff and others who are doing that? And Well, there's a great story in the book about a guy. He was raised in India. It's called Mateo in the book. Very affluent setting. They had three full-time live-in household staff, and they had two full-time chauffeurs in addition. And so he said, notwithstanding all of this, all these people, uh, every day, he and his brother had two, three non-negotiable expectations from their parents. One was they had to keep their rooms clean and they had to make their beds. Two, they had to set the table for every meal and they had to bring their food off the table. And three, they had to, and I was floored by this given that there were two full-time chauffeurs, uh, they had to get themselves to and from every school sporting event on their own. And this wasn't like uh, voluntary things. These were like their team sporting events. And I said, how did you do that? He said, well, you know, we just took public transportation, and we, we did it, and we kind of got rides with other people, and we walked. And 
I, he said, I know, this would just sound crazy in today's modern era where kids are being driven everywhere. Um, he's in his 50s now. He said, but I can't tell you, I developed such a sense of resilience from this. He's now a successful serial entrepreneur. Um, he said, I learned that I could do this for myself, that I, you know, I wasn't reliant on someone. And I'll spend one more minute on Mateo because he did something really fascinating. At that time, um, I don't know if these are still the estate planning rules in India, but at the time, um, when you turned 18, you were just given your inheritance. And uh, what he did was he gave it back and he bought a ticket to America and he left the country and he has never gone back. And I was talking to him saying, why did you do that? And he has a great relationship with his parents, by the way, and they did continue to invest in his company, but he always capped them at 10%. Um, so I said, why did you do that? He said, well, the reason I left is I was 17 and I had just done something really wonderful at school. He, I forget what he told me he did, but he said, and he overheard people talking nearby, but they didn't know he was there, saying, yeah, he did that, but there's no way he could have really done that on his own. He did that, that's only because of who his father was. And he said, if I don't get out of this country, I will never be my own person. So that's what motivated him to leave. Um, okay, so that's chores. Let's talk about high school jobs. So high school jobs, sometimes people say, you know, that's sort of like a thing of the past. Kids can't even get these jobs anymore. Um, we can talk more about that if anyone's interested, but I, I do firmly believe kids can get these jobs. But we, my, my daughter and I went to this fast food place near us, um, near where she has a class, and we've become friendly with the manager, and he had a hiring sign. I said, oh, you're hiring? He said, yeah. I said, what about all these high school kids around here? And he said, oh, they don't want this job. They come in here with $100 bills, and they get their burritos, and you know they don't want to work here. I thought, well, that's so fascinating based on what I heard from these kids, because most of them, when I asked about, tell me about work, started with these stories about, oh, my best, you know, my first experience of working was a high school job. And then they would just sort of go on about how wonderful these things were. And what I learned was there were three things that a high school job taught these kids that I think would actually be very challenging to learn elsewhere. Um, one was, for many of them, it was their first taste of money that they earned, their own money. And so they, in many, many of them were sort of glowing about, I remember when I earned it, I remember when then I bought something with my own money, and whatever they bought with their own money was so much more important to them than whatever wonderful thing they had been given. Um, the second thing is these kids learn through high school jobs to work for someone who was a superior to impress an authority figure other than their parents who love them. Um, and there was a great story from the book about a guy who said he was in a ski shop and he said he realized within about two weeks that he was more competent than the 50-year-old manager of the ski shop. And so he said, now what do I do because, you know, this is awkward and I don't want to lose the job. Well, within a month he was, within a month he was put in charge of the, the ski shop. And so, you know, I think you could just think about all of the social skills that he had to navigate to be able to affect that solution. Um, not easy, and what a great experience. Um, and the final thing that kids learn is, uh, and this was so important, I'll read a brief quote about this. It's probably the first time that they are out in a milieu that is something other than what they grew up with, and they're peer to peer with people. Um, the guy I uh, interviewed said that he, Basically, he said a lot of people, he was working as a, uh, at, at age 16, everyone in their family had to go out and get a summer job. So he went out and got his, and he was working at a restaurant. And he said a lot of people working as short order cooks were on leave from prison for smaller crimes like drugs or DUI. I learned that these people deserve a second chance. I didn't have to be their best friend, but I could maybe learn something from them. And a lot of the kids I interviewed, I call them kids because they're grownups, um, said something like this, that it was not until they met people who they were peer to peer with who might actually be living off of whatever small wage they were getting for their summer job that they realized all of a sudden like the lines being lifted off their eyes that what they had grown up with and that sense of perspective gave them a much better um, understanding of all they had to be grateful for um, and the final thing about work is avoiding the passion trap. So I mentioned at the beginning this issue about passion. So when I was researching this, um, the Harvard Business Review actually has a ton of blog posts on this issue. Apparently, there's a funny article that tracks the use of the word passion in our national lexicon. And, and apparently, before 1970, it really wasn't there. And then it's had a meteoric rise ever since. Um, and this really is apparently bugging the uh, HBR and all the blog posts because they're saying what's, what's happening is kids are signing up for their first job, expecting passion to sort of alight on them. And like, I, I, will, I will just 
stay here until whatever I'm passionate about occurs to me. Um, and then, you know, that job will appear. And they're saying it's just exactly the opposite. That, you know, what happens is you get after it, you work, it may not be great, you sort of stick with it. And through all that, you learn what you're actually most interested in. So what these um, people's parents did very well was they had two messages that they combined. And this is really important. I recommend this to my clients now. Um, they definitely said, find work you love and find what you're passionate about because it will, it'll be enjoyable. That'll be a wonderful thing. But they coupled that with this really important message, which was that may take a while. And in the meantime, learn from every job. Give every job your best effort. You know, understand that everything you do can probably lead to something else or teach you something about yourself. So what I heard from these kids, they had this sense of um, patience. They were able to be in jobs that might not have been all wonderful until it turned into something more interesting or they accumulated skills that actually then were valuable and led them to where they wanted to go versus what probably a lot of us see, which is the kid who sort of shows up on day one, expects the wonderful job to happen. It's not, you know, they have one bad day with their boss. They think this isn't really what I'm passionate about. And oh, by the way, there's, you know, an annual gift in my bank account that I can live off of for a little while. And it just sort of leads to this serial um, job hopping, which is pretty um, demotivating and also um, just it's very ch challenging for people's self-esteem when that's what they go through. Um, so I'm going to wrap up my, my comments uh, talking a little bit about how you can um, encourage your clients to cultivate generosity in their children, given that we are here hosted by the San Francisco Foundation, um, which I know does wonderful things for families um, and encouraging not only conversations like this, but also giving families the opportunities to involve their kids um, in philanthropy. So what I really learned from these kids is um, in, in, that, in many ways it follows the trajectory that we've just been hearing about, which is first, um, here's what I think doesn't work. What doesn't work and I see not working very well is parents trying to use philanthropy as a solution to a different problem. Like we need to get the family together or we need to get these kids to focus on something. Let's use this. Um, what does work, and it's very similar to what um, these kids have said about all the other aspects of these skills they develop. First, developing these core fundamental core success factors the kids I found who had those success factors were more apt to be more generous because they felt a so strong sense of foundation. Um, they knew where they were, they knew their contributions to the world, so they could sort of look beyond themselves. Whereas the kids who still are struggling to develop those, even if they're given money to give out, um, are tend to sort of be very inward focused and aren't really sort of authentically uh, generous necessarily. Um, the other thing is cultivating a sense of perspective. The chapter we didn't talk about here is all about the values that these families communicated in terms of materialism does not make a life. You know, there was a time when we didn't have money, that might happen again, you need to be able to thrive in any circumstance. The issue about the high school jobs, all of this cultivates a sense of perspective that wakes kids up to the fact that what I grew up with is not what everyone grows up with and I want to help others um, to sort of bridge that gap. Um, and finally, as with so much of this, so much comes down to the kids owning the generosity. So giving kids the opportunity to volunteer with their parents, role modeling volunteering. I know um, I heard from Ruben that what the San Francisco Foundation does is help identify, say, over the holidays, things that families can go to together. What I heard from these kids, what spoke louder than any money that the parents were giving was how they were using their time. Um, there was Mateo actually talked to me about how his mom would every morning get up at 6.30 and she'd be out of the house the whole day and come home at 7. And that entire time she was volunteering at a battered women's shelter in India. And he said that was what she talked to me about that was that was her contribution. That was her life. You know, that's how she contributed to the world. Um, and so sort of modeling giving of time, that speaking very loud to kids, especially when they're young. Um, and finally, encouraging kids to give away their own money. Uh, just like the kids valued so much what they bought with their own money, they value very much the gift that they make with their own money, more so than what they give that may have been money given to them to give.